So welcome everybody to today's event sponsored by the Willendam Center. Uh, you were probably expecting to see Steve Fasari speaking to you today and Steve is with us in the audience. Uh, he's saying hi. My face is probably unfamiliar to many of you. So let me take this chance to introduce myself. My name is Guillermo Rosas and I'm professor of political science and associate director of the Willendam Center since July of last year. I will uh, introduce our speaker in a few moments. But before doing so, let me remind you of our forthcoming event on Wednesday, April 14 at noon, when we will have our last luncheon of the academic year. We will be joined by Tim McBride uh, from the Brown School, who will talk about the fate of Medicaid expansion in the state of Missouri, which is up in the air, it seems. We will also be joined by Ariela Schachter. Uh, Professor Schachter from Sociology recently obtained one of the Widemann Center's first large impact grants and she will talk to us about some of her research on the area of migration. Finally, our very own Steve Fasari will provide us with an update on the American Rescue Plan that President Biden signed into law last month. So now moving on, it is a great pleasure to welcome uh, Susan Stokes, who is the Tiffany and Margaret Blake Distinguished Service Professor and Inaugural Director of the Chicago Center on Democracy at the University of Chicago. Professor Stokes has also uh, held appointments at the University of Washington and at Yale University, and she's a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. Her research has been funded multiple times by public and private foundations, including the NSF and the Guggenheim, MacArthur, and the Russell Sage Foundations. Her work spans various topics uh, within democratic theory and comparative politics and has received multiple awards. Her 2013 book, Brokers, Voters, and Clientelism, won Best Book Awards from the American Political Science Association, and her earlier book on neoliberalism in Latin America was similarly recognized. Her most recent monograph, Why Bother? Rethinking Participation in Elections and Protests, addresses the puzzle of citizen participation in political collective action. As director of the Chicago Center on Democracy, Professor Stokes has been instrumental in jumpstarting the Bright Line Watch, which is a multi-university initiative that continuously surveys the public and political science experts to take the pulse of democracy in the United States. Professor Stokes' talk today is entitled, Is Direct Democracy Good Democracy? The Logics of Referendums. I anticipate that we will have plenty of time at the end for questions from the audience. Throughout the talk and at the end, if you have a question, please feel free to write it in the chat window and I'll present it to our speaker. So now, without further ado, please join me in welcoming Professor Sue Stokes. Uh, Sue, the floor is yours. Well, thank you so much, Guillermo. It was, it's, it's lovely to, to see you, lovely to see everybody. And thank you, Guillermo, for such a kind introduction. Uh, I'm going to seamlessly share my screen here. Um, I'm going to be talking today about um, a, a project on referendums um, and direct democracy. And I'm going to be drawing on a project that is collaborative with um, several of my graduate students from Yale, who I happily have not have not uh, not not lost in the transition back to the University of Chicago. Um, that includes Eli Rao, Radha Sarkar, and Shahana Sheikh. Um, and the the research has been conducted under the auspices of the um, of the Chicago Center on Democracy. So democracy today is under stress. In several major countries, including Brazil, Turkey, Russia, Hungary, and the United States, would-be autocrats have won elections and then undermined the institutions of democracy, sometimes with the approval of large segments of their populations. Democracy, uh, democratic legitimacy is also tarnished by major corruption scandals. Um, in the part of the world where Guillermo and I do most of our work, there's the, um, the Operation uh, Car Wash scandal, which began in Brazil, but sort of seeped out to a lot of South America. And in fact, um, as of now, uh, has led to the indictment of several South American uh, presidents and former presidents, among others. Um, and you know, we look around and we see the um, performance, and in many cases, sort of underperformance of uh, elected governments in response to the, um, to the COVID pandemic. And um, many people infer that there is a kind of a competency, competency gap or some other um, problems that are related to elected government to representative democracy. So the overarching question 
of that's motivating my research on this topic is what potential do referendums and other instances of direct democracy have for sort of shoring up the um, burnishing the legitimacy and shoring up the kind of uh, um, the esteem and, and generalized acceptance of democracy as a form of government. So democracy and representative systems are sort of um, uh, almost synonymous in our usage. Since the uh, late 18th century, democracy at the national level has basically meant representative government. Um, but that's somewhat misleading. Um, a good 60% or so of representative democracies around the world maintain institutions that I'll loosely describe as mechanisms of direct democracy. Um, and that number, that percentage rises if we consider, uh, be, if we go beyond national exercises in direct democracy and include statewide and even local such exercises, then you would include a country like the United States, where we have many citizens initiatives and, and referendums at the local and state levels. Um, so let me just start by clear. Oops. Just sort of clarifying a, a, a little bit of terminology, when we talk about mechanisms of direct democracy, there are a number of more sort of specific institutions um, or practices that are that that fall under that category. Um, there are ones in which the people are asked to vote on matters of public policy or other matters, and the convoking agent, if you will, is um, the government. Um, uh, so it might be a president, it might be a prime minister, ruling party, um, but they decide to turn a matter of public policy over to the people. Um, I'm, by the way, using the term, I'm using referendums as the plural um, rather than referenda. You see both in the literature. I'm, I defer to um, older and wiser colleagues who know a lot more Latin than I do. And just, just so you know that that's an accepted form as well. Um, I'm not going to go into detail on the differences between plebiscites and referendums. That really is a a difference in terminology that varies from country to country, the, the legal meaning and constraints of those two different forms um, is, is different from country to country. Um, th there are also referendums that is um, a, a, another kind of instance of a popular vote on public policy called by opposition parties. These are usually referred to as abrogative referendums. So you're basically asking the people to reverse something that, that, the, that has been passed by parliament or a government. Um, and all of that is, is quite different in its logic from citizens' initiatives, which um, will be you know, familiar to many Americans, where, um, where people sort of, where, the, where the, the motivation, the, 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 the instigation comes from below, um, from groups of citizens who, um, who sign petitions to get uh, a matter on the ballot for, uh, for a public consultation. Um, now we know from research that the, the differences between those these are, are a little bit less than, than I'm uh, giving the impression, but th that's, that's some just basic um, basic uh, differences in uh, basic terminology to orient you. Um, so what why might so to go back to the basic question. Um, do mechanisms of direct democracy, and more specifically what I'm looking at uh, at this stage is referendums, do they have the capacity to improve the legitimacy and sort of burnish the image of democracy in a period when the form of government is under stress? Um, so why might, why might they have this effect? Um, well, one reason to think that they might is that these politicians who call referendums sometimes do so for that reason. So it's sometimes clear that the reason for calling a referendum on a topic is that um, that matter of public policy will be kind of um, enshrouded in greater legitimacy um, if it has the people sort of uh, imprimatum uh, behind it. Um, and, uh, and I think it's fairly intuitive that there is some kind of holdover notion that there's something especially legitimate about the people making their views known on a matter of public policy. There are also are a priori reasons to think that there may be obstacles to this kind of legitimizing effect of referendums. Um, we know about um, phenomena such as favorability bias, um, which means that people's views, voters' views of the legitimacy of a mechanism of an election are can be biased by 
how happy they are about the outcome of that election. So um, if you think, you know, there may be some instances that jump to mind in, in uh, presidential policies, politics in the United States where the losing side questions the legitimacy of the procedure itself. Um, and that, uh, that has been shown to be true with regard to referendums as well. So there's some research that shows that when people are asked whether in, a, in the context of referendums that are not technically binding, whether um, legislatures should follow the lead of the public after it votes, if people are told that there has been, uh, when, when the, the, um, the, the outcome of the, of the, the uh, sort of uh, um, toy referendum is one that people approve of, they're more likely to say that it should be binding. Um, similar potential obstacle has to do with margins of victory, and this is true in candidate elections as well. Um, when the margin of victory of a referendum is slim, uh, it's seen as less legitimate and less binding. Um, for that reason, we have certain kind of, there are often rules in place, sort of um, uh, uh, quorums, participation quorums um, attached to, to, to referendums, a little bit along the same logic as in ballotage systems that um, there are um, margin of victory kind of requirements for, th for the winning side. Um, a third thing I'll mention just as a kind of, again, an a priori reason why we might think that referendums don't entirely solve the problem of legitimacy is, has to do with turnout. Um, other things being equal, people tend to see low turnout elections, whatever kind of election, as, as, uh, as less legitimate than high turnout elections. Um, and Again, that is a matter that has been shown to be important in, in relation specifically to referendums. Now, that particular problem is quite acute because um, referendums tend to have low turnout. So just to give you a sense of that, um, this graphic shows us, sorry about that, um, indicates the so um, the, this is from our own data and it indicates um, when referendums have lower or higher or the same turnout as a paired um, national election that's the one that's closest in time before the referendum um, and the cases that fall in the, the zero bar are ones in which turnout was identical um, and then all of the, you can see most of the, um, the density here is to the, to the left of zero. So those are all cases in which referendum turnout was lower than in candidate elections. And those to the right, the small number to the right are ones in which referendum turnout was higher than in, um, than in candidate elections. And these are all um, cases in which the referendum was a, was a one-off vote. It wasn't paired, it wasn't simultaneous with the, with the candidate election. So you can see that there um, is low, it tends to be low turnout in referendums. And the, on average in these data, the, the difference is 21 percentage points. So it's a, it's a significant substantial difference. Um, one piece of our research is aimed at kind of figuring out what lies behind that. And I'd be happy to talk um, about what our thoughts are about the reasons for um, that kind of uh, lethargic tendency toward lethargic turnout in referendums. Um, so um, how, how to think about the, you know, sort of the legitimacy of having the people directly have a say in, um, in matters of public policy. Um, I turn to political theory, to some of the history of political thought to help us think that through. Um, as you know, as many of you will know, uh, there were many thinkers in the history of, of political thought going back to the late 17th century and, and late 18th century more so, who were sort of starting to think through what are the puzzles and problems with this form of government that we are kind of zeroing in on, this representative systems. Um, and there were, um, right through the 19th, and early 20th century, um, very substantial, and I should say really until this day, very substantial disagreements about whether the degree to which voters should defer to the opinions of their elected representatives or whether they should think about those elected representatives as sort of vehicles for their own opinions and their own preferences. Um, and you know, their names will come to mind that'll be familiar. Um, people like um, Burke, who was very much in favor of um, of uh, elected representatives sort of ignoring the the um, the views of the of constituents on this matter or the other, and then um, you might think of Rousseau as sort of the opposite the opposite dimension where um, the elected representative really the the people are almost morally responsible for everything that their elected representatives does. Um, 
The one thinker who I find particularly helpful in this context is John Stuart Mill. Um, Mill is helpful because he um, he didn't he didn't he took a, a sort of Burkean stance in general, advocating for constituents to defer to the better, more informed opinions of their elected representatives. But he also identified conditions when they should stop doing that. What, or to put it the other way around, when elected representatives should pay attention to the, the wishes of their constituents. So Mill wasn't thinking about referendums. That was not a, uh, a, an institution that, was, um, that existed in sort of early, mid 19th century um, Britain when he was, a, when he was both a, a philosopher and a member of parliament. But he was thinking very hard about instructions, which, um, which meant um, constituents sort of writing out to their elected in campaigns, and then this would be a sort of a list, a sort of list of, of, of demands or of instructions to their elected um, representative, indicating how that person should vote, how he should vote. These are all mine at this time, obviously. Um, and so um, Mill thought in general that instructions weren't a good idea, but sometimes they were a good idea, and we can sort of take that some of his logic and apply it to the institution that's, that um, is kind of equivalent in our own day, which are these mechanisms of direct democracy. Um, so let me take just a minute to delve into um, Mill's thought. Um, so um, this is Mill in a more Burkean moment. He wrote, um, this is in Considerations on Representative Government, superior powers of mind and profound study are of no use if they do not sometimes lead a person to different conclusions from those which are formed by ordinary powers of mind without study. So why bother sending these representatives to, um, to sit in parliament um, in Westminster if, um, if you don't let them be informed about public policy, engage in deliberations and, um, and, and come to views of their own, which, which you, dear voter, dear elector, um, don't have access to. Um, and he continues to sort of in the same vein, um, when the representative differs in opinion from the majority of his constituents, his opinion will be he, meaning the representative, will uh, be the oftenest right of the two. Thus, the electors will not do wisely if they insist on absolute conformity to their opinions as the conditions of his retaining his seat. So the, the question was, should you sort of um, force uh, a representative down um, or, or force them not to, to not to continue to serve until the next election if they depart from um, from your from your instructions. Um, Mill thinks that's a that's a bad idea. Um, so, so far, this is sort of a familiar John Stuart Mill, who is quite um, uh, believes very strongly in um, in expertise and in education. Um, and in the better judgment of more highly educated individuals. Um, and yet, um, here is Mill thinking in a somewhat different way. He writes, if it is important that, that the electors should choose a representative more highly instructed than themselves, it is no less necessary that this wiser man should be responsible to them. So you're not just sending a member of parliament off to do whatever he feels like doing. He, he needs to represent you. Um, and then what does, what does that mean? What does it entail? Um, Mill writes, um, yet does parliament or any of the members composing it ever for an instant look at any question with the eyes of a working man? When a subject arises in which the laborers as such have an interest, is it regarded from any point of view but that of the employers of labor? So what is the instance in which uh, an elected representative should pause and perhaps um, not defer and not ask the, his electors to defer to him? Well, he's giving us a hint here that it has something to do with social class. And it has to do in particular with the inability, um, the lack of opportunity of laboring class voters to um, have a candidate who reflects and experiences their own class condition um, because such people were not candidates for, um, for parliament in Britain at that time. <clears throat> so Mill is very skeptical of the ability of elected members of parliament from the aristocracy 
from among the merchant class and even from the lower gentry to understand the views and interests of working men. He believed that if people do not perceive their representatives as, and, and as good agents of their interests, they will not be good citizens. So strong was his view that, um, that this view that he thought that representatives should sometimes defer to their constituents, even if their constituents were wrong. So he wrote, a people cannot be properly governed in opposition to their primary notions of right, even if these be in some points erroneous. Um, so um, just to sort of recap that final very important point coming out of Mill, um, workers didn't couldn't vote for working class, couldn't vote for candidates from the from the laboring classes. The um, the, the the those candidates the, and the who the people who eventually became members of parliament were um, incapable of seeing things. Did not themselves ex have the experience of being laborers. And more strongly, he felt that Mill felt that these uh, these members of parliament simply were going to be incapable of even posing themselves the question, how does this how does this bill look like from the perspective of a laborer? And therefore, sometimes in those kinds of situations, you they needed to defer to the opinions of and preferences of their um, of their constituents. So from uh, sort of little foray foray into the nineteenth century um, uh, thought on representation, I um, and let me just hasten to add this is very much a work in progress. So I'm excited to get your feedback on this, but I'm trying to call some um, kind of criteria for thinking about when is it helpful, when is it legitimacy, legitimacy restoring, um, when is it burnishing of representative systems to have um, voters, in this case, engage in direct, uh, it, to, to decide directly on matters of public policy now via referendums, not instructions. So one criterion I call the importance criterion um, many citizens view um, some matters as uh, as extremely important, and Mill had very colorful language for conveying this notion. He talked about certain issues as being the, uh, like the lifeblood of people, um, and they they so view it independently of whatever efforts politicians might make to convince them of their importance. So these matters that come to referendum votes should be very important to voters, and they should be important to voters even before politicians come in and tell them that they should be that they should take them in, import, as important. Um, second, very important is what I'm calling a non-processing criterion. Um, and this means that a matter cannot be processed through representative institutions and the party system. And to put a little bit more meat on that, that there's something about the way representative institutions are working or are not working or the nature of the interests involved um, or something about the nature of the party system, um, a, a, a concerned citizen can't use those devices of representation to get her preferences across to, to in, in the public sphere. Um, and, um, and we'll have a chance to, to flesh that out a little bit more you know, when I talk about specific cases. Um, next uh, is a deliberation criterion. The public deliberations, discussions, and campaigning leading up to, to the referendum vote inform members of the public well about how, about how their values connect to the issue at hand and what the important likely consequences of one or another outcome of the vote will be. And you know, those of you who follow referendums and plebiscites around the world will be able to think of cases where that doesn't seem to be the case. Of course, it's also true that we often are not particularly well informed by deliberations and campaigns in, in candidate elections, but this is, seems to me to be an important criterion. And then finally, a minority protection criterion. So referendums, plebiscites and the like are very majoritarian in nature. Um, and um, it should be the case that neither the process leading up to the referendum nor its results should threaten the rights of minorities. Okay. <clears throat> so um, my collaborators and I are sort of coming at this, pro this, this topic in part from a kind of political behavior standpoint, sort of how do voters um, act in referendums, plebiscites and the like. Um, and we're also interested in coming at it from an elite perspective, how do politicians, office holders, governments, prime ministers, and et cetera, um, uh, act 
when did they decide to hold them? How did they how much effort did they decide to put into, into getting out the vote? Um, a series of questions of that kind. Um, and on the elite side of this project, um, one of the things we're trying to do is understand the reasons behind politicians' decisions to hold, I'll just call them referendums for short. Um, and um, we are in, in the process of assembling a database that, um, that in, can, contains in, information, a, a whole bunch of different kinds of information about referendums at the national level. But included in that is understanding the kind of the, 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 the strategies, the strategic logic of calling them. And, um, and there are a number of different st strategic logics, but not, as, not nearly as many as there are referendums. Um, there are some definite patterns that emerge from, from our, our study so far. Um, and in the, uh, the, the, um, the, the talk, the, the rest of the talk, I'm going to explore um, two referendums that um, are emergent situations, which I call referees. That is, that is, these are referendums in which the government is, um, is basically using the people as a referee because the governing party is divided on the issue at hand. Um, that is... Um, uh, and, and uh, I'll talk about that more in detail when we talk about these cases, but there are other reasons that um, why referendums are held. And I'll just, just to give you sort of a feel for that, I'm gonna mention a few of these. So I mentioned the people as referee, um, that was the case in the, the Brexit vote in 2016, which I'll talk more about. Um, it was also the case of uh, um, a, a kind of mechanism, direct democracy that was, that was held to, um, to, to reform same-sex marriage, to introduce same-sex marriage in Australia in 2017. Um, in 1916, you know, th there are many instances I could point to, but 1916 in Australia as well, there was an issue of, con of conscription, a prime minister who wanted to introduce conscription during World War I and didn't have his party's backing and, and so turned to the people as a referee. Um, so that's one kind of strategic situ situation. A second is when the, um, the government is basically using the people as a force field. Um, and this is when this is when this sort of legitimacy function that I alluded to early, earlier really is the center of the story. So um, for reasons having to do with um, perhaps um, uh, uh, when it's viewed, when the implementation of a given policy might be difficult, that's often a reason why governments will say, okay, um, we're gonna get the, we're gonna sort of put an aura of legitimacy, extra legitimacy around this public policy by getting the people to vote on it. Um, and, uh, and we call this a, a sort of force field logic. That was the case of the Colombian peace accord ratification um, referendum that was held in Colombia in 2016. Um, it was the case of a same-sex marriage um, referendum in Ireland in 2015. Um, also a gun control referendum on gun control on banning um, firearms and ammunition in Brazil in 2005. Another example is Austria, a, a nuclear power um, referendum in Austria in 1978. So those are just a few examples of those. Um, as you can imagine, there are other kinds of situations um, that give rise to referendums. One is that um, it sometimes uh, convenient for governments to kind of exploit divisions among it, among its opponents. Um, so twice in France, there was uh, there were referendums that were held uh, in order to kind of as kind of wedge issues against the against the opposition. Um, there are so sometimes referendums are kind of um, efforts to kind of build an issue into a, govern, a, governing, a, a, a governing party or a, a, a mandate as it approaches re-election. So they're trying to basically sort of say, this is in our agenda and it's really in our agenda. Um, so improving chances of re-election was, a, a, um, was an objective of the Polish government when it held a referendum in 2005 and the New Zealand government in 1992. There also are a number of instances, and uh, we Latin Americanists will find this rather, um, uh, you know, familiar, where um, referendums or plebiscites are held as a kind of a process 
part of a process of executive aggrandizement, of sort of working around the legislature, uh, encroaching on the, the powers of other, um, of other branches of government, such as the legislature or the courts. That was the case in Ecuador in 1997. It was also the case in Russia in 1993. Um, so, um, so those are just some examples, but as I mentioned, I'm going to I'm going to home in on this uh, the ex the logic that has to do with with treating the people as a referee, and I do so in part because it sort of coincides with uh, the um, non processing criterion that I mentioned earlier. So one of the reasons why a, a member of the public might not be able to use the party system and use her vote in candidate elections to express her views on a matter of public policy is that, the, is that leading parties might be divided, internally divided on these matters. Um, so let me, I'm gonna start by talk, I'm gonna talk about the um, Australian 2017 same-sex marriage referendum. And I'm also going to talk in, in a minute about Brexit. Um, and just to give you a little bit of background about, about the Australian case, um, the governing party at this time was um, a, actually a coalition, a, a pre-election coalition of the Liberal Party and the National Party. So this is a conservative coalition. Um, the Liberals were internally divided on same-sex marriage. I should say that the issue was really put on the agenda by civic organizations and social movements and had been pushed for a number of years and public opinion was shifting more and more in favor of same-sex marriage. Um, the Liberal Party was internally divided on same-sex marriage. The Australian uh, Labour Party, which is the uh, which was the major party in opposition at this time, had begun. It sort of tracks if those, those of you remember how things evolved with the Democratic Party in the United States. If you can, many, you know, us gray hairs will remember going back to the Clinton era, the Bill Clinton era, that there was a lot of hesit hesitation, a lot of rejection of same-sex marriage. Similar kind of process here uh, in, in Australia where the, the major kind of left of center party had been opposed to same-sex marriage became, became more and more in favor of it. By the time the vote happened, it was, it was in favor as a party, it was in favor of same-sex marriage, pushed again, I reiterate, by, uh, by, by uh, societal actors. Um, but the liberals were internally divided, the nationals were opposed. The prime minister at this time was a, a man named Malcolm Turnbull. He was a liberal, and he was personally in favor of same-sex marriage. Um, uh, so um, I uh, kind of present here a very simplified kind of um, uh, il analytical illustration of the kind of the situation um, in this case. So um, the the problem that Turnbull, the the prime minister, um, had was whether to hold a conscience vote, ha hold a, a, a legislative vote on same-sex marriage, which by the way, the courts had said, you can do this by legislation. It's not a matter of constitutional, um, to, of modifying the constitution, which matters a lot in Australia because by constitutional law, um, all constitutional modifications have to go to a referendum so that it didn't have to go to a referendum. Um, Prime Minister Turnbull could have called for a legislative vote and if he had called for a legislative vote and made it a conscience vote for his own party, it would have passed. It would have passed on the strength of um, liberals who were in favor of same-sex marriage, plus the Labor Party, plus um, assorted other smaller parties, Green members and the like. Um, or he could call a referendum. Um, and if he, um, if he did, if he called for a legislative vote, hardline holdouts um, who were dug in against same-sex marriage um, might have resisted this move and provoked what's known in Australia as a spill that is an, an internal kind of deposing of the prime minister. Um, so that was what um, Turnbull would have anticipated if he looked down the, the, the tree, if he went the route of legislation, um, if he, he could call a referendum, which would produce either the status quo if it went down to defeat or a po the policy change that he favored. Um, he wanted to avoid a spill above all else. And um, so if you look at this by backwards induction, um, the holdouts would topple the government if he held a legislative vote. And so he decides to hold a referendum. Now, <clears throat> um, what's implied in this situation is that um, the holdouts themselves 
preferred to let the people um, act as a referee. Um, and that isn't just something that I'm making up. It's actually something that they that you can hear in the speeches, in the parliamentary debates. Um, so I'll give you an example of a national party senator um, who um, is in is against same sex marriage, but basically sort of says, you know, if we hold a referendum, um, I'll let the I'll I'll vote the way the people tell me I should, but the way the the referendum decision goes. Um, this is Senator Ian McDonald. Um, sorry, a, a liberal from Queensland. I misspoke, not a National Party member. Um, he, he said, I will be voting no at the plebiscite, but whatever the result of the, of the plebiscite is, that is how I will vote in Parliament. I have made this known publicly a number of times. If the Australian people decide to vote yes to the question, then that is how I will be voting in the subsequent legislation. If they vote no, then that is how I will be voting when the bill is brought before Parliament. Um, so, you know, in other words, I'm against it, let the people decide, um, and that seemed like a better, uh, a better course than continuing to fight over this in Parliament. Um, and uh, uh, ju so just to kind of give you a sense that this isn't just an Australian phenomenon, um, I, you know, consider the situation in Ireland in 1985, um, that's a case in which Fine Gael, um, which is one of the, the major parties, um, and it was at that time a senior coalition member with Labour Party was split, and this time the, the issue is divorce. Um, and younger, the young Fine Gael members were, uh, were pushing for uh, the legalization of divorce, um, and others in the party were opposed to it. So again, a par internal division within the party. Um, and the, the sort of the first step that um, the Teisha um, decided to take at the time was a sort of a temporizing one to form um, um, an Erechtus, and I've worked very hard to try to <laughs> figure out how to pronounce those words, um, the, a, a sort of joint commission of the, of the parliament to study possible reforms for the dissolution of marriage. Um, and what this, um, the uh, committee decided to do was to opt for a referendum. And again, the logic here is um, we can't really figure this out. We're internally divided. It would be easier for us to go for a referendum. But um, I wanted to just give you a feel for the um, some of the language from that committee's report. Um, they wrote, the committee feels that it's important to state clearly that support for the holding of a referendum does not necessarily imply support for divorce. It's perfectly logical and reasonable for a person to hold the view that a referendum on the question or um, of whether or not the Orishtas should have the power to introduce legislation for divorce should take place whilst at the same time holding the view that any such legislation would be unnecessary or undesirable at this time. So utter contortions um, in order basically to say, we're going to hold a referendum. It doesn't mean we're pro-divorce. Doesn't mean we're anti-divorce. We're just we're going to we're we're just going to let the people decide. Um, okay, so back to Australia and same-sex marriage. So the twist of this story is that, notwithstanding the kind of um, you know game theoretic sort of decision to come that to come to to hold a referendum, they weren't actually or or a plebiscite. Um, in this case, they weren't actually able to pass the necessary legislation to hold the plebiscite because of opposition in the Senate. Um, and um, the reason for this opposition, uh, the opposition coming from the pro-same-sex uh, marriage parties, in particular the Green Party and the um, Australian Labor Party. So why did they oppose a referendum? Um, so one of the reasons that was given in parliamentary debates, so in other words, you have the anti or mixed parties who are in government saying, let's just hold a referendum on this, let's hold a plebiscite on this, and we'll let the people decide. The pro-same-sex marriage parties are saying, no, not so fast, we don't want to do that. Why did they not want to do it? Well, the first reason they gave was that it would be expensive to hold a plebiscite on this issue. Um, my own view is when parties of the left tell you they can't do something that presumably they would like to do because it's going to cost too much money, your um, you know BS detector should be buzzing. Um, they probably also were afraid that the plebiscite would fail, and they had good reason to think that because referendums, which is the more common, I, again, I won't go into the details of the differences. Referendums are um, notoriously difficult to get through in Australia. I think they have like a 
80% failure rate. So there was just fear that this was going to go down to defeat. Um, but another reason that was given in the debates was that it would that a debate and kind of public processing of um, the question of same-sex marriage would expose vulnerable minorities to um, to harm and to potential public shaming and to um, vitriolic public statements and the like. And I mention it because it it resonates, I think, with the question of protection of minorities. Um, there, that was that was a concern of their kind. So what did so Turnbull, clever politician? What did he do? He said, "Forget it. I'm going to hold something that is a total." Um, innovation would be a polite word. It's a hack. We're going to have something called a, a postal survey. And I control the post, postal services, the head of the executive branch. And I also um, you know, am the head of the Australian Bureau of Statistics. And I'm going to have them put their two heads together and send out a survey to every person, every adult in Australia. Um, and they're going to fill it out at home. And they're going to send it back through the post. And we will then count, and it's got you know it's got no legal status. It's, it's certainly not binding, but it'll tell us something about how people feel. Um, so that's what they did, and um, in fact, um, the uh, postal survey was um, a, a roaring success from the perspective of Turnbull and from the perspective of same-sex marriage um, advocates. Um, first of all, this you'll, some of you recall that Australia is a compulsory voting si system. They have compulsory voting also for referendums and plebiscites and the like. Postal survey has got nothing of the sort. It's just a survey. They still had very high participation rates, um, probably because of the salience of the issue and also because I think they're just accustomed to take part in these things because of compulsory voting. Um, so, and, and it passed something, something close to a two to one margin. Um, and indeed, the 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 legislature, the national legislature in Australia, very promptly said, "That's great. We're going to pass this." So, and they enacted legislation modifying the 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 the, the nature of um, of marriage and made it um, between two persons and not not necessarily between a man and a woman. Okay, um, so I know that time is 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 passing, and I'm just going to sort of speak a little bit more briefly about the. Brexit experience, which is probably more fresh in your minds and more salient to you. Um, so Brexit happened because the British Conservative Party was deeply divided over continued uh, membership in the in the EU. Um, by early 2016, five cabinet members out of 22 had declared themselves in favor of leaving the EU along with 12 ministers out of 48. Um, the broader set of Tory politicians was even more divided on this issue. Um, in the end, 323 conservative members of parliament, uh, of the 323 total conservative members of parliament at, um, in, in, uh, in mid-2016, 138 of them chose to, to, to vote to leave the, um, the, uh, in the referendum. Um, and so that's 43% um, of their parliamentary of the parliamentary party. Um, there were pressures, uh, there were some inter-party pressures as well. There, the UKIP was a strong anti-immigration and anti-EU party, um, and, uh, and, and that was a concern. But really, the leading concern had to do with internal divisions within, within the party. And um, extra credit is naming all these, uh, these uh, pro-leave um, uh, Tory um, important people. Um, but what I want to focus on is the, um, the reasons that David Cameron had for calling for a referendum. Um, the key thing is, and this comes out really clearly in his memoirs as well as in, in some other sources, um, was the, the, the sharp degree of insecurity that the person at the head of the party and the head of the government felt um, because of these deep internal divisions in the party and in the government. Um, and again, this is from his memoirs. He writes um, that a leader of the conservative party can never for a minute forget one vital statistic. It only takes 15% of your MPs, in my case, that meant 46 of them, to write to, tri to, write to trigger a vote of no confidence in your leadership. Not once during the 11 years as conservative leader did I feel secure for any length of time. 
Um, so, you know, it's fun to read his memoirs. He comes up with lots of, he's a very intelligent man. He comes up with lots of additional kind of more public sounding reasons for having held the, um, the, the, the referendum on the Brexit referendum. Um, but he's quite candid about the, the degree of insecurity that he had to feel on this issue as well. Okay, um, so you can make the case, I think, that Brexit was um, an instance of non-processing of an issue um, by representative institutions and by the party system. So think about what it's like in the United States. Um, think about the issue of abortion. If you are um, pro-life or pro um, or pro uh, uh, choice, you have a very you can easily map your preferences onto our prevailing party system. Um, if you're pro-choice, you and you're let's say you're a single issue pro-choice voter, you vote for the Democrats. If you're um, if you're pro-life, you vote for the Republicans. Um, that was not true in the UK because of this. You know, Labour was pretty much pro-Remain with some equivocation, as you recall, in the party, but pretty much pro-Remain. But if you were a pro-Leave voter, you could um, you could vote for UKIP, but it wasn't really a going operation. Um, or you could, you know, vote for the conservatives, or the conservatives didn't have a coherent stance on this issue. Um, so you can make the case that this conforms with the non-processing criterion. Where it really falls apart is on the um, deliberation criterion. Um, so. Remember, I'll just remind you that the, the public deliberation, the deliberation criteria and the public deliberations, discussions and campaigning leading up to the referendum vote inform members of the public well about how their values connect to the issues issue at hand and what the important likely consequences or of one or another outcome of the vote will be. Um, so Brexit failed miserably in this regard. Um, there were many false promises and false claims around the issue on both sides, but especially on the pro-leave side. Um, some of you may remember this, uh, this bus, which um, went around the country um, with uh, passengers like Boris Johnson, um, declaring that, um, the, the, uh, that enormous amounts of money would be saved in um, in dues to the EU, which would then somehow magically be channeled toward the National Health Service. Um, and, um, uh, and there were many more very misleading statements and promises. It also is just remarkable how little anybody knew about how it would work, how, how the divorce would work as the, the I, I happened to, to, um, to travel to London literally days after the vote. And I remember having, you know, everyone was walking around, everyone was walking around London looking like the, the, the proverbial deer with the headlights in their eyes. And I remember having a conversation with a lawyer who said, you know, this is gonna be great for us lawyers because we've been in the European community and the European Union for so long that nobody really knows which laws are British laws and which laws are EU laws. It's gonna be, it's gonna take forever to disentangle those things. Um, but the last thing, so, so very little understanding of what, would, what how this would work. Um, and just mention one final piece of non-information, something that really didn't come out in the, um, in the campaigns, um, was the question of, uh, of the, this border, the border between the Republic of Ireland and Northern Ireland. Um, it was discussed almost not at all in England, um, more in Northern Ireland and, and in the Republic of Ireland, as you can imagine. Um, but there was no sense of how th this problem was gonna be solved. That is the problem of you know, the need apparently to create a hard border between these, uh, at what had been a very, very, very soft border um, and the problems that that potentially could, that putting in a hard border um, could create, um, at, you know, for the, um, the, the Good Friday agreements and, uh, and the, and sort of um, peace and security in, uh, in Northern Ireland. Um, okay, so I've tried to suggest that mechanisms of direct democracy um, are endemic to representative systems. Uh, the big question is whether they can enhance um, or detract from democratic practices. 
Um, I've suggested that it's going to be hard to answer that question until we know a lot more about how referendums work, how they work from an elite perspective, how they work from a kind of a political behavior or voter perspective. Um, and I've dug around in some political theory of representative government to find criteria or to find sort of suggestions of criteria that might guide our sense of when um, referendums are, are a good idea and when they're not such a good idea. I've explored one kind of situation that holds some promise in this regard is that that's a situation in which political parties, leading political parties are divided on a, a matter of public policy and would rather turn things over to the people. So for not particularly high-minded reasons, they might, in a situation in which voters don't have a way of expressing their views through the party system, the party uh, leaders might decide to hold a referendum. Um, and that can be a, a happy circumstance, but there are other criteria that also need to be met, such as the del deliberation criterion, which I suggested was um, was not not well met at all, um, and also the protection uh, in the in the Brexit case, and also uh, protection to minorities, which was of concern in the uh, Australian Postal Survey case. Um, so I'm going to stop there, and I'm super happy to take your your comments and your reflections, and I'm going to un share my screen. Thank you very much, Sue. This is a uh, very, you know, uh, it's very educational for me to see how you're building this research program, how you're approaching this question, how you're studying these uh, interesting phenomena. There are a number of questions in the chat, and I'll uh, do my best to do justice to all of them and to uh, talk about them. We have uh, still a few minutes. Uh, and if you have any other questions, please write them in the chat. Let me start with a couple of questions uh, by Olaf Bertram and Stuart Lombard. They uh, are probably a little bit more descriptive, and, and they kind of uh, they speak to some concerns that I had as well. So you have been putting together some database of uh, of referendums of all initiated by all types of political actors, and uh, I guess what uh, the audience would like to know is what portion of referendums in general are held separately from major elections, because it does seem to be the case that part of the strategic use of referendums oftentimes is to pair them uh, with national uh, elections where what you try to do is to ask the people to show up to answer something so outrageous that you will motivate motivate the base to turn in right so uh so that's a question how many of them are uh, coincide with national elections how many don't and more generally if you have had a chance to break down by other types of uh, of categories is there any difference in the turnout promoting ability of referendums depending on whether they are uh, national or whether they are citizen initiatives or things of that sort. Yeah, no, those are those are great questions. Thank you so much. Um, so the um, there is a, 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 another kind of logic of, of you know why governments hold referendums, and that is to kind of lure people into voting. And I think you mentioned sort of putting outrageous things on a referendum ballot in order to get them to vote. And it, it is possible that they're trying to get them to vote in candidate elections. What we've become aware of is um, that working internally to referendums. That is, um, so there was a referendum, for example, in Venezuela, I believe it was two, uh, no, it was, ooh, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna forget exactly the year because there were several of them, but um, there were, um, uh, you know, the, the, the real purpose, this was under Chavez, the real purpose, apparently, was to uh, relax term limits for the president. And there were um, all kinds of other sort of nice sounding things that were, I think it was 2007, Guillermo, you may remember. Um, and there were all kinds of nice sounding things that were added to that as a way of trying to get people to come in and, by the way, vote for it wasn't so much for turnout, I don't think, because I don't think there was a quote a, a quorum. Although they probably would have wanted fairly high turnout, every everyone always does. Um, but um, but to, to, the idea seemed to be kind of a, a misdirection, if you will, sort of you know, um, come and vote on these things that sound great. And by the way, we hope that you'll also vote for relaxing presidential term limits. That certainly happens. There was a really outrageous one recently. I think it was la late last year in Russia where. Um, Putin also this so this is sort of the you know part of what's going on again here is a is a kind of executive aggrandizement logic, where um, Putin was trying to put himself in 
um, the presidency for, you know, umpteen years going forward and um, added a bunch of other unrelated uh, referendum questions about same sex, about, about gays, you know, kind of a, a, a homophobic kind of things that would be, you know, attractive at least to some kinds of Russians to come to the polls. Um, so, so that certainly happens. Um, the proportion of referendums that are held um, completely independently without any other national vote going on, I actually don't have that number off the top of my head, and I could certainly find, I could certainly get that, and I and I should have the top of my head. Um, what's interesting, so this kind of reverts to this whole political behavior part of the project, which is sort of why is turnout low. Um, so there are literally kind of referendums that are held simultaneously with candidate elections, and then there are also, um, you know, uh, uh, like the, another important question is how much do people who are involved in mobilization for turnout care about the outcome of the referendum? So one of the reasons we think that there's, among others, that there's low turnout in referendums is that the people who mobilize people to vote, so low level party operatives, maybe local candidates and so forth, just don't care as much about the outcome. There isn't as much at stake, especially in sort of clientless systems, there's very little at stake. So they just don't work as hard to do it. Um, so, so that's, uh, I, I don't want to go too much in, into detail on that, but that's, um, that's part of the, um, the logic of it. So I, I'll just agree with the premise of the question by noting that politicians often are trying to pair referendum votes with candidate election votes. Um, and they sometimes just aren't able to do it. They can't pull it off. So for example, in 2016, um, the, the government of Colombia that, that wanted to hold the um, uh, referendum or what ended up being a plebiscite on the um, on the the uh, uh, peace agreement with the FARC with co they wanted to coincide with regional elections because they were worried about turnout and they just didn't finish the negotiations in time they couldn't they couldn't do that um, so it's one of the kind of general differences between referendums and candidate elections the candidate elections tend to be kind of pre-scheduled and you know when they're going to happen and and referendums are a little more um, endogenous in terms of the in terms of the timing. Thank you. So, listen, if you don't mind staying uh, five more minutes, perhaps there's a couple other questions in the chat, and then one more that I would like to pose to you. Uh, sure. Ish no or, um, asks about. So, we've mostly been talking about uh, uh, referendums that are initiated by government, but there are also, of course, uh, questions that citizens can put on the ballot. And so we were wondering if you could, uh, you know, talk uh, about, I mean, it's strange that those in principle, one would think, would have more of a potential to be legit legitimacy promoting, right? Because after all, they were put there by the citizens themselves. So first of all, can you address that a little bit more? And second, uh, there's this burning concern that we have in Missouri uh, right now. I don't know if you're aware of the fact that uh, there was a measure put on the ballot to make uh, Missouri and, uh, embrace Medicaid expansion. And the Republican controlled uh, House and Senate in, 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 uh, in Jeff City, in the Capitol, in the Capitol is now uh, threatening to actually not do that. Right? So this would be an instance in which, you know, a citizen initiated measure that in principle could be legitimacy uh, burnishing uh, seems to be uh, Opposed by 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 the representatives that the citizen reelected uh, to, uh, to to the state legislature. So um, again, I guess we'd like to hear to hear you uh, maybe uh, to hear your um, reflections on that kind of uh, of uh, a referendum or of direct democracy mechanism. The citizen. Yeah. No. Thanks for that. I I you know citizen initiatives. I think the academic scholarship, the political science scholarship on citizen initiatives going back a number of years was sort of generated a certain amount of skepticism, I would say, because um, it, be, it if you look closely, especially this is the California initiatives have been studied pretty heavily. And if you look, you know, scratch the surface and they're not, they're, they're the idea that they're the product of civil society acting separately from the political class, you know, from political actors, from powerful people in political parties and government, not to mention um, economic actors that doesn't seem to hold up. You know, they um, parties tend to get involved in various ways. Um, there are you know companies that will that will produce the right number of signatures for you. And so I think there was a sort of a skepticism. Also, this question of when do 
legislatures ab abide by the outcome of referendum. So that also of, of initiatives that also um, is, has been an, a, a real question in, in the California case. Um, I think citizen initiatives deserve another look. I, my sense is that what we're seeing more and more, and this may have to do with um, uh, gerrymandering and um, state level legislatures that are not reflective of the preferences of the public at the state level in the US, um, citizens initiatives become a, a meaningful mechanism for, you know, it becomes an instant, another kind of instance of non-processing. Why can't the, why would the government, an elected government not um, do things that a majority wants it to do in the state? Well, you know, there could be all kinds of um, obstacles of representation that, that have to do with the, you know, the nature of the parties and the primary processes and the, and gerrymandering and so, and so on and so forth. Um, there are a number of these cases around the country just, just recently. Um, so I, I think citizen initiatives are something that we're, we are going to end up looking at more closely. Um, they're not common internationally, but they are um, very common in some cases, like, like the US, like Switzerland, for example. Um, and I think that they, they do raise really important normative questions. Excellent. Thank you. Well, listen, it's, uh, it's 5.05. We've been trying to develop a norm of uh, taking about an hour uh, in this talk. So, uh, unless there's another uh, pressing concern or question from the audience, what I suggest is that you join me in thanking uh, Professor Sue Stokes for her, for her talk today. Thank you very much, uh, Sue. And uh, I'll finish by reminding you all that uh, we have our next and last luncheon for the academic year, uh, next Wednesday, a week from tomorrow, from today, a week from today's Monday, yes, a week from, uh, from this Wednesday. And that's going to be uh, at noon, as always. Uh, so we are looking forward to seeing you there. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Sue. And thank you all. And have a great uh, evening. Thank you very much. I really appreciate your, uh, your coming. Thanks.